Welcome back to Jump Scare, I'm Betty. And I'm Chad. This week we're covering 1981's Monster Club. I will take you to a place where my friends foregather. There you will find stories of such blood-curdling terror it will make your toes curl and your hair reach up towards the sky. He likes to take you by surprise. He likes to leave a very special calling card. It was the best blood I have ever tasted. He's giving you a very special invitation. Three stories to shock you. Chill you. (laughs) Thrill you. And make you laugh. Everybody knows about garlic and steaks through the heart. Yes, we all have our cross to bear. I'm just a sucker, boy, yada! I'm just a sucker, boy, yada! I'm just a sucker, boy. You are one of his kind now. You have to be staked by your own men. Songs by B.A. Robertson. Don't you look down on me. Night. With the strange twist. The pretty things. The viewers. Tell me I'm not going to let you go until you do. We must have our food. But remember, he likes to take you by surprise. You've been invited to the Monster Club. Come at your peril. Welcome to the Monster Club. This film has three recognizable people. The first one is Vincent Price, the star. Then you have John Carradine and Donald Pleasance. Yeah, you got three icons in this one. It's one of those uh, multi-story, it's an anthology. There's three stories. Uh, And three songs. Oh, and, and three songs. As they're in a monster club, yeah. What 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 that what would that entail? You would you would think it, is it a club just because it's a group of monsters or whatever? They take it to a whole other level. You know, it's the early '80s, so which is crazy because you would think the music that they have in the club would be more disco-y, but it was more rock like pop. Yeah, it was like, you know, it was like it's like '80s, 80s pop kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Kind of like a Rick Springfield vibe going with all the rock. Now you have um, John Carradine. He's just walking about the streets at night. And well, he's a horror writer, so, you know, they walk the streets at night a lot. Okay. And out pops a hand, and it's Vincent Price, and he tells him he's so hungry. And he's starving. And, you know, John Carradine, being the nice guy that he is, he's like, you know, I want to help you. You know, let me help you out. And Vincent Price is like, oh, thank you so much. I'm just going to bite your neck right now. Which <laughs> I thought was hilarious because there's a cutaway. They're like, we can't really show Mr. Price put his lips upon this guy's neck. That's kind of John Carradine weird. was probably like, if he actually bites me, I might snap in half because I'm very old and frail. He is very old in this film. I don't even know how old. He would have been around 80. Wow. And Vincent Price was 70 at the time, so this film apparently was released on his 70th birthday, which is coming up in a couple of days. Yeah, in two days, actually. And, you know, the movie opens up with this biting situation, and then, of course, to repay, and he knows, Vincent Price knows who this person is. He's a famous horror writer. And to repay him, he has invited him to enter... And accompany him into the monster club where there's ghouls and werewolves and vampires and all kinds of monsters that this horror writer would love to be, you know, in the presence of because he's a horror writer. And he's going to get juicy stories out of this. And I don't even, (laughs) I don't know if he would get juicy stories out of it because the stories 
like when he enters the club, my first thought was these this is obviously low production. You told me that this did not make a theatrical release over here in the States. No, it eventually came out in the U.S. as one of uh, the uh, straight-to-VHS uh, things that Elvira hosted. Yeah, a bunch of the people in the club that are the monsters are wearing masks, and they just, they're like, I feel like they're the bin. Back in the day, there would be like a big bin that you would enter for like in the Halloween store and all like the forgetting like bastardized masks that no one wanted. The cheap ones would be in this bin. It's like the knockoff creature from the Black Lagoon, but he's pink. (laughs) <laughs> and has like weird eyes. Maybe he has an eye patch on or some shit like that. That's all the kind of stuff that's in the mask. And that's all the stuff that they're wearing. Now, I was going by the assumption that maybe when you go to the Monster Club, you have to wear a cheesy monster mask just to be like, hey, it's like a masquerade for the monsters. Instead of putting on the little old time masquerade mask, they just put on the cheesy monster mask. I don't I think you're giving it way too much credit, but... You know, it's it, it looks cool. It looks fun. I would go. I mean, I would, you know, put my cheap-ass mask on. I, you know, pretend to be a vampire. That's what I'm going with is that. And, uh, you know, oh, like the the smoking jacket, yeah. but it would be the mask. But, I mean, I guess. So, you know, Vincent Bryce proceeds to tell him, you know, three stories what kind of sets off the stories is this crazy <laughs> monsterology, monster genealogy. I don't even... It's the, it's the lineage of the monsters. They have it just, this just hanging on the wall for everyone to look at. And it shows this like vampire, werewolf, and ghoul. And then it's like, and if a ghoul and a werewolf mate, this is what they have. And if a vampire and a ghoul mate, this is what they have. It has like all the different versions of different things and then down at the bottom one of the ones that i thought was interesting for obvious reasons was they have the shad mock the shad mock which would be shad's future costume (laughs) i'm gonna have to figure that one out shad mock so the shad mock was a painting like all the paintings in this were done by uh an artist named john bolton who was famous for working on a lot of things, including a lot of Clive Barker's projects and other things in the horror genre. And ironically enough, we have met him at a convention and he signed my copy of Clive Barker's The Yattering and Jack that he did the illustrations for. And also one of the uh, Tapping the Vein books that I have. And a very nice guy, but I was surprised when I realized he was the one doing the art for this because, you know, this is one kind of early on in his career. You know how you know that someone is studious? How, you ask? Yeah. Um, They're wearing the jacket with the leather elbows. John Carradine is wearing this jacket. Mm, I don't know if you noticed, but that gives it away. Obviously, he has to be either professor or novelist. Those those are the two people. That sets him apart. When you have the tweed jacket with the leather elbow patches on it, that's instantly you're you're a famous author. Instantaneously, yes. I that this just happens. You don't even have to have written a book. You just have that jacket on. You're a writer. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. If a woman or a man, okay, or etc. Would wear a jacket like that to... Lo- it, I, I mean, I feel like other people would be so attracted to this person. Because it's just something about the jacket that says, You are highly intelligent. Wasn't Sutter Kane wearing one like that in the, in the, in the Mouth of Madness as well? He probably was. Because that just seems to be your standard author wear. Um, I actually saw Neil Gaiman give a speech about that one time. And he said that that was uh, many people didn't actually want to be writers. They wanted to be authors. They just wanted to go down to the store and buy their tweed jacket with the leather patches. And then sign a bunch of books (laughs) without actually having written them. (laughs) See, he was fucking on on, on to something. He knew what he was talking about. You know, the other thing that I just found funny was the waitress comes over and asks them what they want to drink. Well, actually, I'm sorry. The waiter comes over and asks them what they want to drink. And, well, it's the waitress and the waiter. They both kind of do. But the, when the waitress brings a drink, she brings a tomato juice for John Carradine, obviously. Yeah. And then, ugh, Vincent Price has to, like, you know, deal with it. He has to drink the O. 
you know, type blood because that's like the low, like rare. I would think that's it's technically that's the rare one, but they ran out of B. That was his favorite, so they didn't have B. But when you look at both glasses, they look the fucking same. Oh yeah, they were obviously both just drinking tomato juice. They were both drinking tomato juice. I mean, try to make at least the one Vincent Price is drinking a little darker. Do I something. don't even see them drink it. It just sat on the table. Because I'm sure you don't want to drink anything that's under those hot uh, movie lights. It's probably instantly melting. Ew, especially tomato juice. Disgusting. Yeah, that would be unpleasant quickly. So the first story is about the Shad Mock, which we uh, mentioned earlier. And he, it's the lowest breed. <laughs> no offense, Shad. It's the lowest breed of monster. Yeah. Okay, which it's a combination. So... The blood, I'm going to take this from the Harry Potter, they get muddled, you know? Yeah. And the mudbloods, you have mudbloods around in the monster world. And this one is like a mix of a mix of a mix. So therefore, it's not that up there. And all it can do is whistle. But when it whistles, crazy shit happens. Yeah, there are some terrible side effects. To the whistling. So we have the... uh the standard couple on there that's like they're a young, attractive couple and they don't want to work anymore. So they hatch up a scheme for the girl to get this job with the Shadmock. And he's like, you know that guy's got money. He's got a big castle up there he's living in. They've got all kinds of old gold and shit. They're in England, obviously. So just get this, get this job, get in there, find where he's got this shit, then we'll steal it and we will be living the life. We won't be slaves to the wages anymore. So she's like, all right. She goes and gets the job with him, and he turns out to be a nice guy. And even though he's a monster, look, he's a decent monster. He makes sure the rooms are filled with flowers for her, and it's pretty obvious quick that he's in love with her. Yeah, wait, you just totally glossed over the fact that she ran out after she saw him the first time. Like, literally almost left it out her purse. Ran out the house, because he was just so hideous looking. And then she tells her boyfriend that she does not want to go back. And she's just like, I'm not going back there, whatever. I'm not going back. Then there's a cutaway. And then here she is knocking on the door again. What the hell did this man do to her? That's what I was thinking the whole movie. What did the boyfriend do? Because I feel like he may have done some kind of abuse, whether it be mental or physical. Because there she was, knocking on the doorstep, when she already had to cross the arm. She was adamant. She was not going back. And then all of a sudden, knock, knock, here I am to be your, you know... Secretary. Uh, secretary. And... You know, uh, he has a few things he likes in life, such as standing outside in the daylight and feeding the pigeons. And then we get the hilarious scene where we see the, <laughs> like, very plump uh, calico cat just watching him and watching him feed the, the pigeons. The close-ups of the cat. Just... And just licking his lips like, oh, yeah, I'm going to eat me a pigeon. <laughs> There's also foreboding... Uh medieval music playing yeah. in the background it said in the captions foreboding music playing <laughs> so you know before long this cat's gonna eat the pigeon which this is the 80s i'm pretty sure they just killed a bird and fed it to the cat yeah that does it look like a real dead bird that they just threw on the ground for the cat to eat and now fortunately they were a little nicer to the cat because when the shad mock sees that the cat has eaten his favorite pigeon he he first gives him the evil eye. The cat hops up into the fountain that he's got and just stares back at him like, the, oh, I'm sorry, the planter. It looked like a fountain, but they yeah, it did. It, it was planter. big enough. Yeah, yeah. And then he hops up in it and gives him like the evil eye, and you get like the like you know good, the bad, and the ugly gunslinger thing where they cut back and forth between the cat's eyes and his eyes, like they're about to throw down. Then the shadmock whistles. Next thing you know, laying out on the ground, looks like somebody lit a teddy bear on fire and just laid it out and the cat is gone. And that's where you see the deadly effects of the Shad Mock whistle. Yeah, it's uh, stay away from the whistle. So it, what blows my mind is, you know, he sends her, she, he, she comes to work one day and there's flowers galore everywhere and... You know, she's he's giving her flowers. And I'm talking about, like, the whole freaking office. Like, his den, his study is, like, filled with flowers. And she goes back every night and tells her boyfriend, like, she can't do this anymore. She doesn't want to do it. There's something off about him. He's terrible. Like, he's horrible. You know, horrifying. 
and she can't deal with it. But the boyfriend's like, look, you're real close. We agreed to this. You gotta keep going. We're going to get this money. And sure enough, within a few days, the Shad Mock is like, listen, I love you. Let's just get married. And yeah, I'm like, you- hello. You just gave her flowers one day. There was no conversations, mind you. He was, uh, it was like one of those things, like, I don't know if anyone's ever had this, where you get hired for a job, okay? And it's like a job at someone's house, and you're doing like weird, like, random stuff okay and the person that hired you for the job just doesn't go away like they're always next to you i've i've dealt with this they're always next to you just talking to you and it's like they literally just hired you because they were lonely and they needed someone to talk to they didn't really need anyone to help them with anything they're just giving you bullshit work you're getting paid at the end of the day but your job is just to be a listening ear And to be of company. And that basically was her job. And how he thought, oh. And he kept telling her, you could love me one day. You can love me one day. And I'm like. And they made it like this guy is the ugliest, most horrible monster in the world. It's like, I'm fairly certain if you just got him a different haircut, he would look a world better with just a different haircut and some new clothes that didn't look like they came out of the 1940s. But. Of course, you know, he gives her the fancy ring from the safe that, like, it was in his, one of his ancestors, you know, engagement rings. He had bought it from some random antique dealer that came to the house. Remember, they gave him, like, the rolls of money? Oh, yeah. But this ring is the fucking ugliest ring I've ever seen, okay? He holds it up to her face. You would think, oh, it's an engagement ring. It's, like, a normal size. It looks like someone melted a whole bunch of fucking, like, gold snakes around like a brown stone it's not like a fucking diamond or whatever it's just like this brown like shit colored stone and i maybe it's supposed to be amber but it doesn't look anything like amber it looks like someone just like terrible costume jewelry for like medusa like and and he holds it up against her face when they first get it and it's like is this just beautiful it matches your eyes and your hair yeah because it's like shit brown like it's ugly so when he takes the ring out and proposes to her and it's like her whole finger is encompassed with this ring and you know then he's like oh uh by the way uh, i have something to tell you uh i'm a shad mock uh can't really explain what that is right now i'm gonna have my you know family come over we're gonna have a ball it's gonna be a masked ball because it's a lot to take in for you to see them all at once and they're just gonna tell you about it you know warning warning kill bill like like that's when I would be seeing Red and I would have to like chop his head off or get the fuck out of there, call a priest to come do some something because obviously there's something evil slash up with this dude and you should not be accepting his proposal. No. The next scene after she accepts his, after she, she doesn't accept at the moment. They kind of do that like off screen is her laying in the bed after her and her current boyfriend has ha- have had sex because they're naked in the bed, like they're just under the covers. He's behind her. She looks like someone threw like va- like a uh, Visaline. What is it like? Visine. Yeah, Visine all over her eyes because obviously she cannot procure any tears as actress. Like her whole face is like covered in like wet streams. Because she was crying. Because she, the guy's telling her, you're just going to have to accept this proposal. It's like, we just did it. And I'm now telling you you have to accept the proposal from this guy who horrifies you. Um, so then, you know, you can still... I thought that... Oh, so we could go about our plan. I thought the plan was going to be like, you're going to accept the ring. You're going to get the code to the fucking safe. Because the guy never went to the bank, obviously. He's like, or gorophobe or whatever. He never leave the house. And he, and the Shad Mock has all this money in the safe or whatever. And she had learned like the combination. By just watching him. By just watching him. And I just don't get it how I thought maybe 
the boyfriend was going to be waiting in the car outside with a big old bag and she was going to be showing, you know, Shad Mock and the, you know, whatever, her goodly goods or keeping him, you or know, just let's give him the safe combination. He was going to sneak in and steal exactly. all the money while she kept the guy distracted. He didn't do shit, this guy. He was the fucking worst guy. Mind you, obviously, he was a con artist, but she did all the fucking work. And then her master plan was just, I'm going to wait till he's not looking at this ball. I'm going to unlock the safe. I didn't bring a bag. I didn't bring a plastic bag from Walmart, even a fucking canvas bag, nothing. I'm just going to grab everything I can grab in my arms and turn around and run out the door. Whoops, I ran right into the shad mock. Yeah, and then this is the part, and I know, obviously, this is a film, and it has to happen this way, right? But this is the part that that always gets me, because you know some shit like this would happen in real life. So she gets caught, red-handed, literally. And she has, like, dropped everything on the floor because she's startled. And the Shad Mock is like, you know what? You can have it all. Give it to whomever you want. I don't care about any of that stuff. I just want to be with you and love you. And I just want to be with you. I just want you. You'll love me one day. You'll love me one day. You think that in all that, as opposed to what she did, which was scream and say that he was horrifying and that she didn't love him and that she would never marry him and all this terrible stuff, say, okay, give the fucker a peck in the cheek. He's never held a bitch's hand. Okay, that was like fucking third base for him. Give and him then a- just get out of there. Exactly. Take all the belongings, get out, and never fucking come back. That's what you do. Yep, but no, she decided to mouth off to him, so he gives her the special Shadmok whistle. Oh. And then she goes home to the boyfriend. I want to. (laughs) Who's like, hey, babe, did you get all the money? Because he's packing all his shit to go. And she just kind of walks in, stands in the corner of the house. She gets a Blair Witch moment part. She just walks into the fucking corner of the house. Then she decides to whip her hood off of her cape that she's wearing and turn around, and her face is half melted off, and it's like, do you love me? Do you love me? And then we see the boyfriend in the insane asylum. He's just sitting in a straight jacket. He's been there for six months. Like, damn, dude, that's what drove you crazy? Oh, that's how that story started. Yeah, it started that way, but we forgot to mention uh, it. I'm just saying, like, yeah, yeah, no, no, you, the insane asylum. Yeah, you just literally, I totally forgot that's how it started. That is so freaking funny. Yes. What the hell, man? My question is... Her face melted. She had no eyeballs. How she drove. This bitch was out in the country, okay? Where the capsules are not in the city, okay? Unless it's Buckingham Palace. Like, he was out in the country. How did she get home? Well, maybe the Shad Mock Whistle, like, teleported. I don't know. We didn't see her get out of the car. Maybe the, like, one of the monster chauffeurs, like, dropped her off the house. Because she's not going to need her car anymore. Of course. This is what I'm concerned about. I'm like, how the bitch got home? And then we cut to... A fucking musical scene. <laughs> yeah, then we have like a whole like song that plays. And like I guess maybe they thought they would, you know, this was the early 80s. So MTV had just started. Maybe they thought, hey, maybe some of these videos will make it onto MTV to help promote the movie. I'm just a sucker for your love. By the way, this was Vincent Price's character, Uramus, right? That was his favorite. Aramis. That was his favorite song. Yeah, I'm just a sucker for your love. I'm just a sucker for your love. So then we cut to our next story, which is all about a vampire. Yeah, the, I don't like the transition to this because it's like a werewolf comes out and he's like the whatever of the club, the secretary of the club. This is the part that I'm just like, okay, the werewolf comes out. We have already established this is everyone's wearing mask, right? No, this person's actually not wearing a mask. He looks like... If someone had seen Teen Wolf, right, the movie, and then was like, you know what? I want to look just like the dad of Teen Wolf, but I only have these pieces of carpet to put on my face. So (laughs) I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to look just like the guy. Spoiler alert, you're not going to look like the guy. You look like a guy who put carpet on his face. That's what this makeup, quote unquote, looked like. It looked fucking terrible. So bad that if, if you watch this film... You don't see the guy's teeth move at all. He's literally talking through his teeth like a ventriloquist. Yeah, because he probably can't move his face because the mask will fall off. It was so terrible. I, I like, but so he comes on and then 
he's announcing the film pro- a film producer who's a vampire because aren't they all? Yeah, Vincent Price just says, well, aren't they all vampires? And the and this is a transition to the next story. The film producer is showing his next the clip for his next movie. Spoiler alert: it's the whole fucking movie because what what else left? What what else was left in the movie? That was it. It wasn't even a trailer. It was the whole movie, which is based on some kind of like folklore, right? The story um, of this vampire, of like a Romanian vampire. Let me tell you, have you ever seen like, um, was it, um, I was going to say Frankenstein. Um, oh my God, that's escaped me. But the Roma- like Romanian music with like the high pitched. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what this cuts with. Oh, goodness. The music alone, the like the background music to this story killed me. I was just like, when is this going to end? Because I did not enjoy it. This one to be the most comedic of them. There was a lot of like slapstick going on in it. I this is really the care. one Donald Pleasance was in. Yeah, and Donald Pleasance leads a group of vampire hunters that they're hunting a vampire that's living in london they're called the beast squad or the blamey blame blimey bleeny boy bleeny boy bleeny the bleeny <laughs> the bleeny boy say that 20 times so they you know it's just a obviously the guy's obviously a vampire you get to that in like two seconds his son doesn't know he's a vampire yet and he mouths off about his father and his job and his being an account from romania from romania and all this and vincent or i'm sorry uh, donald pleasance who's just hanging around outside the school like a creeper, hears this, and follows him home immediately. Okay, his name is Pickering. Okay, that's Donald Pleasant's name uh, in the film. And let me just say that Donald Pleasant is wearing like half moon spectacles. He approaches, he kind of saves the little boy who's like this pitiful little boy, right? And every one of the kids hate him. They pick on him. He's so pale, whatever. And he approaches the kid and the kid tells him, hey, my mom told me not to talk to strangers. Uh, so Donald Pleasant's like, it's fine. You can trust me. I'm a clergyman, wink, wink. And offers him a caramel. And the fucking kid spills his guts. Okay? It does. It does. He tells him every fucking thing. My dad sleeps in the under, you know, at the bottom of the stairs and this and that and everything. I was just a kid. He just gave you one caramel. It's not like he gave you a gold fucking bar of chocolate. Like you just said that you're not supposed to talk to strangers. So that whole scene was kind of like creepy because it's like, oh, it's fine. I'm a priest. You can tell me anything. Here's some candy, little boy. Like, uh, no, Donald Pleasance, don't do it. <laughs> and the freaking dad. Tells the son not to trust anyone with a violin case. Because apparently the vampire hunters in this group all carry their stakes and hammers around in violin cases. Which is totally awesome because you would never suspect, you know. They even have it like the cut out, like the, you know, the assassin rifles in all the movies where they have all, they just assemble the gun. They've got it in the different like slots of the briefcase. That's how they have the violin case set up. Yeah. I also thought it was hilarious that the film producer, this was like biographical yeah. Like for him, this was like him as a kid. He had made this into a movie. This was like his kind of story of when he was a kid and what happened to his dad. And yeah, it did take, it, it was supposed to be comedic. The movie overall, the tone is basically, it's all over the place. It's one of those like films you have to watch because it is classic and it's fun and it's Vincent Price. Like, And this is one that I, I hadn't really ever watched it. I think I might've seen clips of it. But I had seen this in video stores for years. It was sitting on the shelves, but I never actually watched it. This was one of the ones, like I said, it didn't get a theatrical release over here, but it did get released where Elvira hosted it as a, on one of, when she put out that series in the mid-80s. And it was one of the ones that you'd see. It was in the old, big-style box with Elvira on the cover, like pointing to a painting of the Monster Club and... Yeah, that, so I had thought about renting it a bunch, but never did. So I was glad I finally got around to watching it because it is it is a fun one to see. It, it was fun. I love the music. There was one part, uh, one of the performances was super fun and clever that I really enjoyed. And I don't want to give it away, but whatever. It but kinda... watch it and watch for the scene with the stripper because it's amazing. Yes, there's a scene with a stripper and it's pretty fantastical. We thought it was fantastical. Uh, the last... You know, these stories, they usually, like, they all have names, right? But they're, like, literally what the story's about. The first one, 
the Shadmok. The second one, the Vampire. The third one, Hyungu. Like, that's it. And that, the Hyungu is a product of a human and a ghoul. Yeah, which that whole story, I I like the story, but also I think it actually was my first favorite story. Then the second one was the Shad Mock, and then the last one was the Vampire. The last one is the one that I can see if you expand it a little bit, could be a little bit longer and maybe its own movie if you did it right. Yeah, I did like that one. It's a film producer who's looking for a shooting location, and he goes out to the middle of nowhere, kind of crosses over into another area, you know, like maybe it's another dimension, maybe it's like a hidden area. You only get there certain times when the mist is around. First of all, okay, you're looking for like this little fucking cut of land because you want to do a movie in some freaking like little village. When you see... A wall of mysterious fog. Maybe don't fucking drive your fucking car through it. That'd be my plan. That when like there's no fog anywhere else. There was none in the street. There was none like a little bit down the road. Then all of a sudden mysterious fucking thick ass fog everywhere. Tur- no, don't even go in there. Back the car up. Make a U-turn. Get the fuck out of there. Because it's not going to be a good time for you. And it wasn't for this guy. The part of the story that really got me was when the little girl, the Hume is literally telling him, hey, my mom, she got lost in the fog. She got lost and entered the fog too. Then she had me and then we, and then they took her out and they buried her and then we all ate her for the good feast. And I'm like, what the fuck? So they literally... Forced this woman to have sex with one of these fucking ghouls. First of all, it's a ghoul. How does it have sperm? I thought it was dead, but fine. Then, I mean, they're, they're, they're cannibals. So they're how, like, nutritious, you know, could, like, nutrition on their side. How could that be good? How could the sperm be good? I have so many questions about that, but never. So they forced to have sex with her because I'm doubt by the looks of all the men that were there, none of them were attractive, and I don't think this was a fucking love story. And then, not only do you get raped, have to wait nine months, supposedly, that we know of, because we don't know if it's the ghoul process. She could have given birth in, like, three months. Who knows? Had to give birth to a fucking kid, okay? Then she gets buried, and then she gets eaten. That's terrible. It's yeah, a, not good times. It's not good times. I don't know if the daughter partook in the... I don't think she did. I think this happened while she was a baby, hopefully. Well, what exactly were they eating anyhow? But like, she brought the guy, like, dinner. It's like, here, I brought you something to eat. You just said the only thing to eat in the town, you've eaten all the dead bodies in the cemetery. You've eaten all the animals around. Well, it looked what? like gruel, so it was probably literally just fake food because one he never ate it and two it was probably like mushed up fucking grass maybe there was a potato like around like potatoes can grow like you know maybe that happened i don't know but it it did not look good yeah it looked like campbell's like soup vomit like the thick white what is like mushroom soup it looked really nasty so yeah you know it's not gonna end well for him even though you can kind of hold the ghouls off with the cross and make a run for the fog Of course, they do the worst run in the world. Like, look, I'm not a jogger. I'm not a running kind of person. But when there's a pack of cannibals that are going to eat me, chasing me, you damn well better believe that I can run like a son of a bitch. The adrenaline alone. You'll see my knees coming up all the way to my fucking chin as I'm running like this. (laughs) Down the road to get away from this shit. No. I will rest on the other side. Like, once I get across the fog, my fucking feet can be bleeding. I can be, you know, passed out from exhaustion, but I will be out of there. This guy's just taking a light, leisurely jog while the cannibals are all chasing him, throwing rocks at him, trying to eat him, and the girl. To be fair, he was for a long time bearing that big old fucking heavy cross that looked like it came out of the fog. Like, it was huge. <laughs> Still, the adrenaline. I'm going to be running, carrying that thing over my head, screaming the whole time. That's, that's, and you had nothing to eat. You didn't even eat the gruel, so you couldn't even get any fucking nutritional value from that. The adrenaline's going to get me out of there. Well, it's not good times for the guy, but, like, what are you thinking? I don't know. I I was, I I did participate in this. Uh, I became that audience uh, member. I was yelling at the screen. Yeah, but this guy makes some mistakes and it just does not end well for him. No. You know, and then 
at the end of the film, Vincent Price just wants John Carradine to join the monster club, even though he's not a monster. Or is he? Then they go on to the whole, like, speech about these humans, they develop atom bombs, knives, guns. They even make viruses they can shoot across the planet and kill each other. Wink, wink. Now tell me, are they monsters or aren't they? Yeah, the moral of the story is the humans are the worst fucking monsters. And everybody hanging out, all the monsters in this fucking club, just need to accept this one guy. Because he's freaking, uh, what is it? Like He's like the head. He's the token human. Yeah, he's the token human. He's representing the human race. And he's a horror writer. So, he's the greatest, you know, monster of all. The end. I think literally the whole film was just made just to just say the humans are the worst monsters. Because it's a, I mean, it's a pretty in-depth monologue. There's one scene where Vincent Price, and I would have loved to have asked Vincent Price, like, hey, what would you think about this uh, whole monologue you did about this? He literally goes to, like, 20 different ways humans have been killed over, you know, the whole span of, like, humans have been yep. alive. It's pretty intense. But yeah, and then when it's over, it's just over. It's like, well, you're in the club now. And then he's like, yay! Everybody dance! And then the dancing begins. And then cut to the credits. Yeah, they're gonna play the, the main song, which is the Monster Club song. Yep. And then it, it's the end of the movie. The, the wraparound story... It's not that strong, uh, obviously, but I give it two knives. I've seen worse. I've seen way worse anthologies. Yeah, I'd give it two knives as well. I, I, you know, I can tell that they didn't really have an idea of a tone for it. That this was one of those things I think where they were just like, "We got all these actors. Let's see what we can do because we have eleven dollars to work with." And that was about what they had to look like. Supposedly, Christopher Lee and who else? That other dude that always gets these movies? Peter Cushing. They uh, passed on this and Vincent Price was the only one that said yes. Supposedly. I don't know if that's true. I don't but, think Vincent Price said no to anything. Though. No, because he was like any fucking good actor out there. He's like, work is work and it's fucking putting, paying my bills and putting food on the table. And he loved to cook. So he needed that, that extra money for all that delicious food he made. I love they had a quote with him one time where they he said something to the effect, they asked him, like, aren't you afraid of being stereotyped? And he was like, oh, no, stereotyped means you're employable. That means they always have a job for you if you're a stereotyped actor. He's like, I, I'm more than happy to fall into that. Yeah. You want to put me into a, you know, put me in the cliched mad scientist, whatever? Fine. Give me the money. I, I can't blame him. There's worse jobs out there to have. Yeah, there is. And you know what? I don't think there's any shame in that. I mean, I know a lot of actors, you know, they're a little hoity-toity. But a job is a job. And... You better to better to like you said better to be a stereotype and always be someone of need than be someone that no one needs you know yeah. you're not gonna be the freaking main star all the damn time even though technically he was the main star in all his movies yeah i guess typecast is a better word not stereotyped typecast well yeah, yeah. it's the same kind of along the same thing but yeah if he's typecast as a scientist or whatever that's a fancy him... hollywood term for yeah. stereotype so, yeah, like I said, I'll go with the two stars as well. It's a fun movie. It's not the greatest of every anthology, but it's a fun one. It's really, I guess this would be a kind of a good one to introduce, like, kids to for a monster movie. Yeah, I would introduce a kid to a monster movie. Like, this is obviously a kid that's... Maybe like, 10. I would... Before they watch the films and TV of today, like, yeah, this would be this. like, we would hope our daughter would watch something like this so that they can appreciate it. Because you can't watch, like... I'm trying to think of, like, a modern horror movie that's, like, amazing. The Witch. Fine. You can't watch... You can't watch The Witch. I was thinking more of something with, like, CGI. But you can't watch The Witch and then, you know, watch this. Like, that's not gonna... Even Halloween, you know, 1978 version. The You can't watch that and then watch this you'd be like ah eh, that wasn't scary or there was whatever this is definitely like i'm introducing you You're right off the, the bat concepts and this is gonna kind of get you used to 
monsters and a little bit of creepy stuff and then we will work your way up so yeah i can see it being this yeah because i think anthologies are a great way because they're all different little stories you know they're gonna have different feels to it and different monsters to that effect because then i would think the last anthology you would probably show like a kid would be like trick or treat that's like the earliest one that comes to mind yeah that i care for oh the one that we saw on shutter that i really like mortuary collection yeah that'd be a good one that is an excellent movie that movie definitely i really enjoyed that film trick or treat then the mortuary collection or either or but definitely those would be like the latter ones because i would think you would do this then you do like tales from the dark side tales from the crypt Creep show. Um, creep show, creep show two, you know, ugh, those are so good. You gotta work the kids up on stuff. Yeah. Not the recent ones. I don't care. Not that anyone needs to know that, but I don't really care about this new T V show that's happening with the creep shows. I don't Yeah, I haven't really watched it much lately, but it didn't seem to grab me right away, so Yeah, well thank you so much for joining us on this monster on our last Monster Mayhem. Monster Mayhem episode. There's no theme for next month that we know of. Maybe there will be, you know, we'll just come up as we go. It will be organic. Um, <laughs> or maybe it won't be. Thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned to the horror. And now, folks, it's time to say goodnight. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.